The colonel went on to tell me he would be moving his CP up as soon as possible. We checked watches, the current password, and the location of the forward aid station. I couldn't help but notice that no mention at all was made of what our battalion's three other companies would be doing while F Company was out there in attack. The colonel wished me luck, and I took off quickly. Also absent from my orders were any suggestions on just how to get this job done. That was strictly up to me. I think I was flattered. As I walked back to the company with my runner, I tried to get things straight in my own mind. I knew the location of all friendly forces from the positions clearly marked on the map. Many unknown items confronted me coldly. We were all aware that the Germans held Grosshau, but I had no idea of where their defensive line was and whether it extended outside the village. Night attacks are very difficult and usually require a lot of planning. To control and direct men so they shoot the enemy and not their own is a major concern. Exact directions and signals that are easily seen or heard must be worked out. Radios and other equipment must be secured and checked. Passwords have to be assigned. The order of movement determinate. With experienced men and officers who know them well, night attacks are still one of the worst assignments possible. We did not have any of the proper qualities, and time was also against us. Our only advantage was the ability to move in the darkness. I hoped my new officers would be able to follow instructions and that I would be able to stay in contact with them. When we got back to the company area, the officers had the men almost ready to move out, since they were also aware of the rumor about our being relieved and sent to the rear. I wasn't eager to give them my news. I sympathized with them as I repeated our attack plan. Even in the twilight, their shock and dismay were apparent as the dangers and risks sank in. Slowly their faces returned to normal as they realized the necessity for the attack. Yet I could almost hear them saying to themselves, Please, tell me this isn't so. Tell me it's a nightmare. I went over the big picture once again and then got down to details, keeping them brief. Control of the men is paramount. I had to appoint a leader for every six men. If there weren't enough sergeants, I would have to appoint acting. Sergeants at once. I told the men to keep me informed by radio of everything they did. I admonished them that they wouldn't be able to see much, so they had to be extra careful. They might run into friendlies, so they couldn't shoot too quickly. If any man moved from where he was supposed to be, he was to check with me at once. We then double-checked passwords, watches, and radios. When I felt we were ready, I moved the company out in column of platoons, with the first platoon leading. I went with the first platoon, following the lead scouts along with the platoon leader. We passed through the front of E Company, and headed northeast along the edge of the woods in the general direction of B Company. We had gone about three-quarters of the way when our scouts abruptly fell flat and shouted out a challenge. The password that came back was delightfully welcome. By great good fortune, we had run into a small group of walking wounded from B Company itself, along with a couple of stretcher cases carried by German prisoners. The sergeant leading this small group had only a slight arm wound, and he asked us the way to the aid station. I gave him directions, and then asked if he knew how we could contact B Company, since their radio was out. He said he could tell us, but that the route was pretty risky because of the open ground. So we tried the radio again, at short range, but with no luck. And then I asked the sergeant if he'd go with one of my men and take a walkie-talkie to his captain, and he agreed to give it a try. It seemed only a few minutes later that we got through to B Company on the radio and I was able to get the complete tactical situation from their captain. The Germans had several strong points to the captain's front, making a frontal attack very hazardous. The captain said the Germans were well dug in and were also using the cellars in town for protection against our artillery. He had seen plenty of action on the west side of town where he was and also on the northwest, but he didn't know about the south. He hadn't seen any action there and thought it might be our best approach if we could get across the open ground. I thanked him for the very important information. Based on this, I told him we would enter the village from the south, near its southwest corner. He wished us luck and said they would try to hang on until help arrived. Using a flashlight under a couple of coats, I showed my officers the general layout on the map. From our position, about 500 yards southwest of town, we would head due east, 
until we were even with Groschau, when we would turn northward. One platoon would lead off the attack and take the southwest corner of town, and then continue northward in hopes of getting behind the German front-line defenders. The second platoon was to follow right behind, and then turn to the right when it reached the north side, thus getting behind any defenders up there. The third platoon was to follow along until it got to the edge of town, and then was to turn to the right and take care of the south side. There were only two blocks in the town, so we planned to mop up quickly. We hoped no civilians were in town. In the darkness, they could easily be killed by mistake. After another strong reminder to the officers to keep a close hand on their men and to keep me informed, we shoved off. The moon was not yet out, and far across the wide fields the ghostly shape of Grosso seemed to beckon. We crouched low to reduce our silhouettes as we quickly filtered across the field. In a few minutes we came upon a small cemetery on the southwest corner, and, to my immense surprise and relief, not a shot had been fired. I couldn't believe it. A few minutes later the lead platoon jumped off in attack. They came upon the Germans from the rear, as hoped, and took them completely by surprise. Apparently they were exhausted themselves, and had given all their attention to their front. I couldn't understand why they had had no defense at all on their south flank, but I was deeply grateful. The moon was still behind the clouds, and in the full darkness it was difficult to keep close track of the men as they went from house to house to root out the krauts. We had only a few flashlights, but still managed to find sometimes two and sometimes up to eight Germans sleeping in each cellar. Some of them didn't show up until daylight. In a half hour we had the town secure, a job made easier because no civilians were found. I radioed Colonel Keenan, who was profuse in his congratulations as he told me the rest of the battalion would be moving up shortly. Meanwhile, I had set up my main defensive line on the eastern side of town, close to the important north-south road. We were prepared for a German counterattack. Around midnight I felt everything was completely secure, so I tried to get some rest in a nearby cellar. I was just getting comfortable and starting to reminisce about how incredibly lucky we had been to take Grosshaus so easily when a messenger roused me to get me up to the front line. There I found Caldwell quite bothered and upset. The forward observer agitatedly pointed to the ridge out front and slightly southeast of town and asked if that didn't look like Germans to me. With the help of field glasses and in the light of what was by then a very bright moon, I clearly made out a column of what could only be enemy soldiers. They were wearing German long coats and were marching in single file toward the northeast, about 500 yards to our front. Caldwell complained that he had fired a couple of rounds at them, but that when he had ordered a barrage, his battery had turned him down. His commanding officer explained that his map showed that the hill was being held by Americans. So I trained the field glasses on the marchers once more. And in addition to their long coats, I saw that they were carrying long-handled shovels, which our men rarely had. I then called Colonel Keenan and asked his permission to fire since both the artillery F.O. and I were positive they were Germans. The colonel called me back in a few minutes and told me he had checked it out and had to deny permission. He said a unit from the 5th Armored Infantry claimed they had men on that hill. I protested so heatedly that the colonel told me to send out a patrol to check firsthand. One of my new lieutenants led a small patrol across the road and along a small ditch toward the marching column and I watched intently through my binoculars. They got within fifty yards of the marchers and radioed back that they were definitely Germans. He could see the cut of their helmets, their long coats and long shovels, and, most convincing, that they were carrying their wounded toward the German front, and they were speaking German. Colonel Keenan still was reluctant to let us fire, and he ordered me to send out another patrol, this time to the 5th Armored, about a half-mile south on the road to Kleinhau. The patrol leader returned in about an hour and reported that the CO there stated flatly that his men were dug in on that hill and that he was sending more people up there. I was frustrated and disgusted. Caldwell was furious. The Fifth Armor didn't know how to read its map, but absolutely nothing could be done about it. I went back to sleep. My play-acting radio men had performed surprisingly well that night as radio men. They made a few mistakes but they got right into things and were pretty excited. 
They did their own jobs and even volunteered for extra work when we were in town. I was quite pleased. That night also was a pleasant surprise. The Germans let us sleep. There were no mortars, no artillery, and there were no counterattacks. I almost thought that this respite might be due to their not even knowing we had taken the town, for it had been quick and almost noiseless. Yep. Early next morning I was summoned to a meeting of company commanders at battalion headquarters, now in Grosshau, and our attack orders were very simple. Captain Tolles would lead G Company on the right, and I would lead F Company on the left. We were to cross the open field and advance up the hill to our front, the same hill the Germans had marched along, immune to our artillery, the night before. After covering this ground, about 800 yards, we were to enter the woods and continue the attack eastward along a small fire trail, with F to the left of the trail and G to the right. Meanwhile, 1st Battalion would attack parallel to us and about a half mile to our left. Our objective was the far edge of the woods about two miles ahead, just west of Guy, gateway to the Cologne Plains. Since friendly troops, namely the 5th Armored Infantry, were supposed to be holding the hill ahead, we were to use the top of that hill as the line of departure for our attack. It all sounded simple enough, but to me it was too good to be true, because I couldn't get out of my mind the suspicion that the Germans we had seen the night before might not have gone very far. I expressed my concern but was assured, albeit by people who had not been there with me and Lieutenant Caldwell, that everything was okay. Captain Tolles moved his company up next to mine, and we jumped off as planned. As we headed across the open slope, I kept my men spread way out and watched the ridge line very sharply. It seemed odd to me that the American troops on the ridge were not at all visible from the rear as we approached. Our progress the first 300 yards was almost a stroll, almost like a training exercise back in the States. States? What a strange word and what an impossible distance in the past. Then it happened. The sky fell in and we were in hell. German artillery and mortars, machine guns and rifles, and the murderously direct fire of the tank-mounted 88s all hit us at once. Everyone dove to the ground and then crawled to the nearest shell hole or depression. There was no time to think. We simply reacted. Our infantrymen began to fire back with their MLs, and Lieutenant Caldwell was able to get some artillery on the Krauts, who were well dug in. Now we were paying for the inexcusable stupidity of that armored captain who couldn't read a simple map. It may seem strange that our headquarters did not appear to believe our report of the enemy troops. One must keep in mind that a captain had stated his troops were on the hill. No one was willing to take the chance of shelling our own soldiers based on the night observations of another officer. If we had taken a prisoner, our story probably would have been accepted. However, when in doubt, the colonel had no choice but to refuse the request for artillery. Sad, but true. We had to overcome one more mistake. This battle raged on insanely, impossibly, for hours as we slowly moved forward. In my five months of considerable combat of all kinds, I had never had to endure such a heavy, mercilessly accurate barrage of shells and bullets. The Kraut artillery forward observer was on the heights above us, and he had perfect vision of our every move. They had let us get so far in the open that we couldn't pull back in daylight, and our only protection was the irregularities in the field itself. I know the FO had me spotted because I had to keep moving around while trying to push the men forward, and I was marked by my radio man and his antenna, who followed a few feet behind. It was almost a game, and the German FO was very good at it. No sooner had I changed position and allowed 20 or 30 seconds for the range on his cannon to be adjusted than the shells would start dropping in all around me. He was extremely accurate. He already had the exact range and only had to make very slight adjustments. The mortar observer was just as good as the artillery. I would look up quickly for a new shell hole, get up and spring 10 or 20 yards, and dive into the new hole. After about a half minute, the mortar shells which had to go way up and then drop almost straight down, would pepper the area all around me. Once my radio man and I plunged into a shell hole about three feet deep and six feet across, and we had hardly settled when the mortars began to explode very close to us. Even if it had been possible to hear their vertical descent, the other battle noises would have drowned them out. 
This became my single worst experience of the war. Because the shells came in so fast, I judged they must have had eight or ten mortars zeroing in on us. About 100 shells came down in an area that couldn't have been much more than 50 feet on a side. Why they never got a direct hit, I'll never know. A third man piled in on top of us, and we tried to bury ourselves in the bottom of the hole, praying out loud as we held on for dear life. Handfuls of dirt, chips of stones, and spent shell fragments kept hitting me in the back. The only thing that saved us was the softness of the plowed fields. There could be no tree bursts out there, of course, and the soft dirt let the shells penetrate a bit before exploding and then absorbed much of the force. We were lucky the ground there had not yet frozen. Of course, the fact that there was no direct hit was also a factor in our survival, for which we thanked Providence. And it was on that terrible open slope beyond the hamlet of Groschau that young Lieutenant George Wilson, commanding officer of F Company, 22nd Infantry, came to the very edge of his breaking point. I had to fight with all I had to keep from going to pieces. I had seen others go, and I knew I was on the black edges. I could barely maintain the minimal control I had after 14 or 15 days of brutally inhuman fighting in those damned woods. I had reached the limit of my physical and emotional endurance. The barrage abruptly ended, and a problem with my radio man, the larger of the two buddies, snapped me right out of my morbid thoughts. He was crying again, though this time with reason, and he begged me to send him to the rear. It wasn't the best time to bother me, and I couldn't take it from him. I turned on him angrily and pointed my rifle at his chest, saying that if I heard one more word out of him, I'd shoot. He stopped bawling instantly. A few minutes later in the next barrage, as a kind fate would have it, this radio man was wounded slightly in the arm, and I had to send him to the rear, and then I became my own radio man. His buddy, the smaller man with the SCR-300 longer-range radio, which was used to relay messages, was still back in Grosshau with my headquarters group. But a little later, when I tried to relay a message through, I couldn't reach him. The medics later on listed him as a battle fatigue case. When I look back, I don't see how anything could be worse than the punishment we took that day. The Germans had waited until we were out in the open with only shell holes and the undulations of the plowed field for protection, and then they let us have it with artillery, mortars, rifles, cannon, snipers, and, worst of all, the direct fire of machine guns and 80 mm high explosive HE shells from tanks, right in the line. The tanks at the edge of the woods would shoot he shells into the ground, just ahead of the attacking infantry. After that, the Germans would machine gun the fallen men. I could move only a few men forward at a time. Only those who were fast and could find a hole to dive into after 15 or 20 yards made it. The toughest thing for me that terrible, insane day was to hear stricken men all over that slope crying out for a medic who no longer was there. Our marvelous, courageous medics had been working right out in the open wherever they found a wounded man, and they had all been wiped out. Normally, the medics were spared being shot at by German infantrymen. However, artillery, cannon, mortar, and tanks could not be so selective. Anyone in the area could be hit. Often, it was the misfortune of the medics and stretcher bearers to be caught in an area being shelled. At these moments, I was furiously bitter at that armored infantry captain who had insisted his men were on the hill, and I don't think I could have been trusted near him. Whenever I could get to any of the seriously wounded, I would tell them their only hope was to somehow crawl back to the aid station. Some of the bad ones actually made it. I don't see how. One man made his way over to me, and he was unable to talk, because his chin had been shot away. I pointed to Grosshow and urged him to get there as soon as possible. It was all I could stop to do for him then. G Company, on my right, seemed to be falling behind, so I called Captain Tolls on the radio and asked if he could come up online with my company so we wouldn't be a salient the Krauts could concentrate on. He told me they would be dropping back even farther. Then I received no further response. Later I found out that Captain Tolls had been seriously wounded and that another of my old friends, formerly of E Company, Lieutenant Pisarek, had been killed. Pisarek and I had joined E Company the same day back in July near Carentan, France. 
Without leaders, G Company just didn't move, and many of the men drifted back into Grosshow. Colonel Keenan had me send Lieutenant Greenlee to take command of G, but he got there too late. So from about noon onward, my company fought on by itself. We were nearing the crest of the hill, and what was left of my forward platoons was being blasted by the tanks in the woods, cutting them down like a giant bloody scythe. Lieutenant Caldwell got some artillery on them before he was wounded, and I called for fighter planes. Soon some P-47s came over and strafed the hilltop and dropped a few bombs. This helped quite a lot because it forced the German tanks to take cover deeper in the woods. During what may have been the peak of the shelling, the man leading my left platoon went berserk and had to be sent to the rear. This forced me to call forward a young officer who had just joined me that morning before we jumped off. Since he had had no chance to get acquainted with his men, I had left his platoon in reserve. Now I needed him and told him to bring his platoon up through the left platoon and continue the attack. He immediately began to cry, and he sobbed out that he couldn't do it. Coming in fresh and going out onto that hill looked to him like an execution. He might have been right, but I had no choice in the matter and had to send him to the rear. Thus, for the second time in ten days, I was the only officer left in the company, and most of my non-coms, sergeants and corporals, were gone. I appointed one man a sergeant on the spot. I had long since lost count of how many times I had had to make such instant appointments and promotions. I told him to try to get some of the men on the left moving again, while I did the same on the right. About a half hour later, this new sergeant came over to me and pointed to the only building left standing on the hill to our left. He asked if we had anyone in there. He said it looked like someone was up in what was left of the chimney. I raised my field glasses and sure enough spotted a sniper as he was pointing his rifle our way. I yelled at the sergeant to duck and instinctively pulled him down into a shallow trench dug by the Germans, just as the sniper's bullet kicked up the dirt beside us. Then I told the sergeant to get some of his men shooting at the SOB. He got up and walked nonchalantly about twenty yards to his nearest men, knelt down and pointed up to the chimney. This he repeated to the next group of men, and then he casually walked over to a shell hole for himself. Just as he reached the lip of his hole, the sniper dropped him with a bullet to the head. Damn it! Why hadn't he hustled? The sniper might well have missed. His men quickly got the sniper who also must have been the mortar F.O., because after that the mortars didn't bother us anymore. All my leaders were gone again. I didn't even have a corporal left. Sergeant Bert Smith, the forward observer for the 81 mm mortars from H Company, was still with us, but he was busy directing his mortars to fire on any target he could find. Our day-long infantry attack, along with great help from our artillery, had driven the Germans out of their foxholes in one big log-reinforced dugout at the edge of the woods. As we entered the woods, a quick look around at our strength made me shudder when I saw how few men had gotten through. And with G Company apparently out of action back down the hill, I realized we were sitting out on the proverbial limb. It wouldn't take much for the Germans to snip us off once they appreciated our weakness. So I kept on doing what I'd been doing all day, almost automatically, making quick decisions. There had been no help at all during the battle, and it never even occurred to me to ask for any now. I was still on my own, and my judgment told me to get out of what could have been a trap. So I moved the remnants of F Company back some two hundred yards over ground we had taken and up a slight slope to a former German trench. This would force the enemy to attack uphill and across open ground to get to us. I sure hated to give up ground that had been so expensive, but I didn't see its value if we didn't survive to hold it. Perhaps I should have called Colonel Keenan and requested that he send up E Company to help out after dark, but decided I had to deal with the problem immediately. We moved back to the long trench without any problems, and although we all were close to physical and emotional exhaustion, each man began spontaneously to deepen the trench, which was originally about two feet deep. Some got it down to about five feet before they felt safe. At least the ground was soft and scooped out easily. I had reported by radio to Lieutenant Colonel Keenan and was told to hold where we were. No mention was made of sending up help. I still wonder why E Company wasn't sent up immediately. 
We had started out that morning with about 140 riflemen, a couple medics, three non-coms, four company officers, one attached artillery officer, and one attached sergeant from H Company. We had lost all the medics, all the non-coms, three of the four company officers, and the artillery observer. And we had lost 90 riflemen. This was, and still is, the most terrible day of my life. The ordeal was beyond human endurance, and I cannot understand how 50 of us survived. On the top of the sickening pain of our losses was the nagging bitterness that it probably all could have been prevented if Lieutenant Caldwell, the best F.O. I ever saw, had been permitted to wipe out the Germans before they could dig in. What a difference it would have made to F and G companies. The losses at G must have been similar to ours. If that armored infantry captain had only been able to read his map, that particular battle would never have taken place. Yet again and again, headquarters denied us the action we, who were on the spot, could have taken to such advantage. We had fought all day without food, and now some of us tried to force down a cold K ration, but few of us were hungry. The night of November 30th was cold in that German trench without blankets or overcoats. Wearing only a field jacket, I was so cold that I could not stop my teeth chattering. Although I was completely exhausted physically and emotionally spent, my nerves wouldn't quit. I could not sleep. The horrible events of the day kept churning around and playing back vividly as life. I was sickened with grief at our losses, and yet it had happened so quickly that the total effect was numbing. The loss of one man is deeply depressing. The loss of 90 is just overwhelming. In fact, I was overwhelmed by the courage of those men, most of whom were very raw recruits, and it gave me a sensitive, even touchy, feeling of pride in the fighting qualities of our 22nd Infantry. Emotion was all most of us had left. As I lay there in the chill, unable to relax enough to sleep, I couldn't help dwelling on some of the things that naturally bothered me. Why hadn't G Company come up online? And how badly had they been hit? And where was E all this time? Was it too risky to send any more men out there to help us? Were we being written off and abandoned? More to the point, and this is what may really have been keeping me awake, did the Germans realize our helplessness and would they counterattack during darkness and wipe us out? Since I am only human, I have to mention how pleased I was to hear from friends at Battalion that there was talk that I would be recommended for the Distinguished Service Cross, ranking just below the Medal of Honor, and also would be put in for captaincy. I didn't know about the DSC, but I sure felt entitled to promotion to captain, the normal rank of a company commander. As it turned out, due to circumstances I never understood, nothing ever came to pass. I never thought much about the medal, but being passed over for an earned promotion did rankle. As dawn approached, I got out and made the rounds to make darn sure everyone was alert for an enemy attack. At about this time of day, it now was December 1st, 1944, Private Mays, our former radio man who had been wounded, rejoined us, and with him came a young retread officer. Retreads had been trained for rear echelon work, and now in the emergency, they were given some quick infantry training and sent up to the front. At this time, our 1st, 2nd, and 3rd battalions were given the code names Red, White, and Blue. My new lieutenant told me, Colonel Keenan's orders were for me to hold in place, while Blue Battalion went around our left flank and continued the attack. We were to be alert for any enemy action on the rear or right flank of Blue, and to stop any such attack. I heard myself wonder aloud, what the hell with? It was a tremendous relief to learn another battalion would be leading the attack, and I kept in close contact with Colonel Keenan over the radio. Blue jumped off as planned and made it into the woods on our left with ease. Apparently the Germans hadn't worried much about that flank. An hour later, Colonel Keenan radioed me that Blue had run into a battalion of German defenders and was now having a very rough time. Blue was concerned that the enemy might work around between my position and theirs and attack Blue's rear, so Colonel Keenan ordered me to move F Company, all 50 of us, up into the woods ahead, go in 500 yards, and then set up defensive positions facing southeast in order to cover Blue's right flank and rear. This normally would have been a simple exercise in control, but it was not easy with only one spanking new officer and no sergeants or corporals at all. 
The squads were down to three to five men each instead of the normal twelve, and no squad had a leader. In our exposed position, it was impossible to regroup, so I decided to lump all the riflemen into one platoon for the new lieutenant and leave the rest of the company for me. It was too bad Officer Candidate School never taught us how to operate at considerably less than full strength, for that's the way we always seem to be in actual combat. I called my one and only lieutenant over to my position in the center of the trench and gave him the story of his new platoon of all riflemen with no sergeants, and I told him to lead them about 100 yards into the woods and wait there for me and the rest of the company. I would lead the company myself from there on. Then, by word of mouth, we passed the orders down both sides of the trench. I couldn't help wondering what sort of message the men at the end received. It was a bright, clear mid-morning when I signaled the lieutenant. He at once jumped out of the trench and at the top of his voice yelled, All you riflemen, come on, let's go! He started at a trot toward the German lines and after a moment looked back over his shoulder at a sight that should have given him heart failure. Not one single rifleman was following him. This young retread lieutenant then made a big sweeping motion with his arm, yelled, Let's go! at the men again and continued trotting forward with hardly a break in his stride. I think I was holding my breath. Then suddenly, some of the men on both sides of me began to climb out of the trench, and soon the whole platoon of riflemen was running after him. They disappeared into the woods without a shot being fired. This was one of the most courageous acts I had ever seen, and I recommended the young lieutenant for a silver star, but I never found out if he received it. I felt like giving him mine. When the lieutenant and his riflemen reached the edge of the woods, I ordered the rest of the men to stay spread out and follow me. The Krauts evidently had been surprised by the quick rush of the first wave, but they certainly were ready for us. We could even see the flashes of their cannon a half mile off to the left front, and within seconds the shells were blowing up all around us. I was on a direct line to the cannon, and the shells were so big and were coming in so low that I could actually see some of them flying through the air. This gave most of us a split-second warning, and we could dive out of the way. It didn't help one of the men, unfortunately, and he took a direct hit in the chest. His whole upper body disintegrated, but by some weird motor reaction, his legs kept going a few steps. I almost threw up. I had seen that particular shell and where it was headed. I had yelled at the man, but he never heard me in all the other noise. It was quite a surprise when we reached the woods ourselves and looked around, expecting to be greeted by our new lieutenant, but found no sign of him or his platoon. I left my few men with Sergeant Bert Smith, the mortar, F.O., and went forward with my radio man to look for the rest of the company. We moved forward carefully through about 400 yards of scrub oak and saw no sign of them. Suddenly we heard noises to the front and edged forward slowly. There we found some German soldiers in a small gully working to free a tiger tank that was mired in the mud about 50 yards below us. Very slowly, we backed off. We didn't have a bazooka, and we couldn't be distracted from our main purpose of finding the only riflemen we had. All at once, a chorus of small arms fire broke out that sounded like it was about 200 yards ahead in a patch of thick pines. I'll bet that's our boys, I remarked to Mays. You're probably right, Lieutenant. But if we get caught up there and we lose you, what will the men do? In my heart, I knew this was the plain reality. If the new lieutenant was in trouble, he would have sense enough to pull back. And two of us alone couldn't help him much, so Mays and I headed back. As soon as I rejoined my small group, I had them all pick out old German foxholes, because the shelling might pick us up any moment. Up ahead, the small arms fire became even more intense, with most of it seeming to be German weapons. It's hard to describe what distinguishes different firearm sounds, but after one has heard them a while, it's easy to tell the types of weapons apart. While we were enlarging a shell hole, one of the lieutenant's men, a Latin American, came tearing up to us, all out of breath. He was so excited he chattered out his first sentences in Spanish. I stopped him and calmly told him to speak slowly in English and tell me what had happened. We just ran into a lot of Germans, and the lieutenant sent me to get some help. Quick, he blurted. I don't have anyone to send, I told the messenger. Go back and tell the lieutenant to get back here as soon as possible. He took off again running. Ten minutes later, he returned with the lieutenant and no one else. 
They were the only two who had managed to escape. The lieutenant was slightly wounded. He told me they had moved into the pines as I had ordered and immediately had run into a whole German company. This misunderstanding startled me. I had clearly told him to get into the woods and wait for me there. I couldn't believe that anyone would not consider scrub oaks to be woods. Now it was too late for discussion. Anyway, his men had taken cover under the pines when the shooting started and had tried to hide. He hadn't seen anyone shoot back at the Germans. Some were wounded, and others began to surrender. They were hopelessly outnumbered and out of control, and there was no way a single lieutenant could save them. The best he could do was ignore his wound and get away. Thus, in just a half hour, he had lost about 35 men, killed, wounded, or captured. What had happened there was about the norm for inexperienced men with an inexperienced leader, particularly men who had been unsettled by the most terrible baptism a man could get. Perhaps we had been asking too much of human beings, and that mistake was catching up with us. Men work best in small squads under a leader of their own, and there had been no way to bring this about in that open field in a trench under German fire. The lieutenant went on to the rear to have his wound treated, and I never heard of him again. He had had a chaotic, traumatic three hours in combat, and it must have given him plenty of fuel for memories. Now we were down to only twelve men, including Sergeant Bert Smith of H Company and myself. Again, I was the only leader. What in hell could we do if the Germans somehow found out how weak we were and came in on us? Probably make them pay as dearly as possible, and that was it. We began to dig in and try to roof our foxholes. Some of us leveled off the bottom of a bomb crater that was about six feet deep and twelve feet across. We needed poles to stretch across as a roof, and we cut scrub oaks. This was not easy since we had neither saws nor axes. All we had were trench knives, so we selected the smaller trees, only three or four inches in thickness, and chipped away at them like beavers. Somehow, we finally got enough poles to crisscross the crater. Then we laid raincoats on that latticework and piled dirt on top to help absorb shrapnel. It looked like a pretty strong roof, and it later proved itself. Hey! In two days' fighting, we had gained about 800 yards. In 24 hours, my company had lost 138 men of 150. With only 12 men, we stayed in place that night. The night was nice and quiet, and I slept for a few hours in spite of the gnawing cold. Next day, I moved about 100 yards to a very well-engineered German shelter and made this my headquarters. And soon, E Company moved up beside us, and things seemed to be taking a turn for the better. We took up positions to cover the left of the firebreak road, and E Company took the right. The men were busy most of the day digging and covering their foxholes. Some men had to stay alert for possible enemy action. Thank God, none developed. Later that day, a mortar landed smack on top of the roof we'd made over the bomb crater. The men inside were shaken up and got something to think about, but no one was hurt. A little more dirt on top, and the roof was as good as new. During the day, we received 66 new replacements and a couple of new officers. My orders were to remain in place and set up a defense, so I had the men dig in along the ridge that was our front. Now we had 78 men, and we felt much stronger, although I knew we were far from being a fighting unit. We were getting an awful lot of incoming mortar shells, and mortars don't have much range, so I knew they had to be fairly close by. Our new artillery forward observer sent up the Piper Cub, and it circled around but could not spot any mortar batteries. I borrowed his map and found a few ravines and partial clearings within 2,000 yards, natural places for the Germans to have mortars, which fire in a high arc and so must have a position with no trees overhead. Because of their high arc, mortars usually had to be within a mile of their targets. The Piper Cub was sent to check them out. Soon we were pleased to get his bravo bullseye over the radio. His artillery batteries made quick work of the kraut mortars, and we were able to breathe a little easier. On December 3rd, I got word that another company from a different division was coming up to relieve us, and I spread the word. I knew it was the truth, since it came from Colonel Keenan. And sure enough, at 9.30 that morning, the captain of this relief company came up to check out the area with his officers. I toured them around my defensive position and cautioned them not to bunch up because we probably were under observation and would draw fire. 
They paid no attention to the warning and continued to move around in a tight group, and in less than a minute the shells began to whistle in. One landed not far from the captain, and although he had not been hit, he claimed he couldn't get up. Some of my men had to carry him into my dugout. This relief company was something of an eye-opener for me because they were by far the worst bunch of infantry I had ever seen. They had served so poorly on the front in the swamps near St. Lo that they had been transferred to siege duty around Brest from July until November. They still were not fit for combat. They had a full complement of officers, and even one extra, and were up to full strength in non-coms and enlisted men. After a while, the captain announced that he just couldn't carry on. His exec must have been of the same stripe, for he didn't stir himself to take over. I finally told the executive officer he'd better get moving to bring his company up from Grossau, and when he hesitated, I told him flatly that I was going to move out and that he might have to fight the Germans to get the position back. This got his butt in gear, and in about an hour, he was back with the rest of this truly pathetic company. Privates in this company called their officers by their first names. With this sort of familiarity, it seemed to me there was no sense in taking orders. And they didn't. There simply was no discipline. I even heard a sergeant tell a lieutenant to go to hell, and I think I might have sided with the sergeant. What should have been an easy exchange became a real problem with men milling around, refusing to go where they were told. We wasted no time getting together what was now F Company and heading back over that blood-stained hill and through the shattered ruins of Grosshow, only a quarter mile to our rear. We continued on through three or four miles of shell-splintered, mutilated forest to 2nd Battalion's bivouac area. We were going in the right direction, but I was so totally played out so emotionally spent and physically exhausted that putting one foot in front of the other was a chore. I didn't think we'd ever get there. I was in something of a daze, probably from delayed shock. I was thinking that of all the men who had started out with me in the F Company attack a few weeks back, I was the only one still able to walk out of those awful woods. I might also have been crying. At any rate, my vision was misty, and I didn't see my old friend from E Company, Supply Sergeant O'Malley, when he came up to me as I shuffled along the trail. O'Malley threw his arms around me in welcome and then insisted on taking all my gear, rifle, bandolier, canteen, trench knife, and carrying them the rest of the way. I tried to say something to him, but I became all choked up and couldn't. Our division had been in many battles, but none more costly for the ground gained. We had taken about four and a half miles of forest in our sector, reaching the Cologne Plains, our objective. Our replacement division was engaged there for several more weeks. Perhaps because of the unexpected development of the Battle of the Bulge some two weeks after we broke through the Hurtgen, our gains were never exploited. One might rightly say that the Battle of the Hurtgen Forest was a major military error. The First Army's losses there must be recorded as the most severe of any American army fighting in Europe during World War II. Yet it is not considered a victory, nor is it even known to most Americans as a battle. I didn't know what F Company's losses were in the Hurtgen until Francis Thiefels, the company clerk, told me they were about 167% for the enlisted men alone. This means that we had started with a full company of about 162 men, and had lost about 287, including replacements. Casualties among the company's officers probably were about double that of the men. I personally recall the loss of 12 officers, and I think we lost a few others, for a total of perhaps 14 or 15. It was very difficult for me to believe that of all the men and officers who started out on the front lines in F Company with me, I was the only one who finished, and I had been wounded twice but never evacuated. All I could do was shake my head and wonder. Of over 30 officers in the 2nd Battalion, it appears that Captain Newcomb at Battalion Headquarters, Lieutenant Lee Lloyd at E Company, and I were the only ones who survived the entire 18 days of battle. Our only purpose in fighting there had been to help finish the efforts which had been made by several other divisions. Fighting with us in this last phase of the Battle of Hurtgen Forest were the 1st, 28th, and 90th Divisions and part of the 5th Armored Division. The fighting had been going on for over a month when we arrived. Our goal was to reach the Cologne Plains at a small town named Gay. 
The objective lay only four and a half miles away, but it took 18 terrible days to reach. All the divisions taking part in the battle were badly mauled. The total losses for the 22nd Infantry Regiment with a complement of the 4th Infantry, which was part of division in the Battle of the Hurtgen Forest, were approximately 3,000 men. This came to about 100% loss for the three battalions in the regiment. It was an awful beating, a terrible price for that damned patch of woods, a total of about five miles. In bivouac, our men soon settled down for the night. Someone thought to set up a pup tent for me, and I crawled in, still in the same dirty clothes of the last 18 days, without either a shave or a bath. I didn't feel much like a conqueror or victor of any kind. Outright exhausted, I soon was sound asleep. That was the Hurtgen.